Good morning, bonjour, bienvenue à cette conférence de presse sur les villes acteurs clés du développement durable à l'occasion de notre journée uh, sur les villes. I will be very short because our speakers don't need any introduction. So I will immediately give them the floor. And uh, after their uh, introductory remarks, obviously the floor will be yours for your questions. I will now immediately give the floor to uh, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the uh, Economic Commission for Europe, Madame Algayerova. Executive Secretary. Thank you, Jean. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Bonjour à tous. C'est un honneur pour moi d'accueillir le maire le quatre huit présent ce matin à cette conférence de presse. Ils sont les ambassadeurs devant vous du grand nombre de maires que nous attendons au Palais des Nations pour cette journée de ville. Uh, why this is important for us this day of cities? Because cities today are engines of economic growth. Uh, they are generating more than 80% of global GDP. And uh, of course, uh, they are the key actors in addressing the major issues of our time, for instance, climate change, environmental degradation, social inclusion, and mobility. And this is all what, where UNEC can provide uh, the tools to solutions. I found in uh, different conferences, meetings, that uh, cities, uh, as much as important they are, they need to more address Agenda 2030 and its 17 sustainable goals because it was to, uh, found, find out that uh, the big gap in MDGs implementation that we had from 2000 till 2015, uh, the biggest gap was that the MDGs were not localized. So we, what we try to do today, uh, for the first time historically at UNEC, we have uh, more than 40 mayors here, and uh, we are going to speak about Agenda 2030 implementation and how UNEC can help to cities and local governments to address Agenda 2030. Uh, I, will not, I don't need to speak about importance of cities because uh, in 2050 there will be more than 75% of population of this region of our continent live in cities, 80% in North America and close to 50% in Central Asia, what are all our regions, because UNEC is covering 56 member states, what is 1.3 billion of the population. You know, uh, I will give you just a few examples of the tools that UNEC has available. And uh, for instance, air pollution. You know, uh, due to our air convention, uh, we were able to decrease harmful substances in the air in our region uh, by 30 to 80 percent since 1990 in Europe, and to, by 30 to 40 percent in North America. And uh, this accounts for prolongation of life expectancy in our region by one year. Uh, then housing. Housing is a pressing issue in the cities. UNEC for a long time works on housing issues and we establish centers of excellence in cities like Glasgow, Tirana, Vienna or Tallinn. Uh, another challenge for cities is aging in our region because with almost 195 million people in the region who are older than 65 years, we need to address also this issue. And uh, for instance, we have supported Georgia. We have a mayor, a de deputy mayor of uh, Tbilisi from Georgia. We supported Georgia to develop policies in areas such as accessible public transport for all the persons in housing provision. Very critical issue is mobility in the cities. Uh, UNEC is uh, more than 72 years working on clean and safe transport. Uh, today we will have with us uh, SG Special Envoy on Road Safety, Mr. Jean Todt. So you know UNEC is a seat for UN Road Safety Trust Fund that is a global. We have uh, 59 conventions uh, in transport in, uh, at UNEC. 
uh, we have much more examples. Uh, you will see it during our day. We will be uh, together with us. We have many tools for recycling, water management, or re uh, res resilience to climate change. So the strong engagement of mayors here today is a powerful symbol for us to how we can together fully harness cities' potential to achieve sustainable development goals. Je suis convaincu que les innovations menées à l'échelle urbaine peuvent constituer une véritable force d'entraînement au service du développement durable. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Madam Executive Secretary. Je voudrais maintenant inviter le maire de notre ville haute, Genève, Monsieur Samy Canaan, à prendre la parole. Monsieur le maire. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Sanchez. Madame la secrétaire exécutive de la Commission des Nations économiques des Nations Unies pour l'Europe, dear colleagues from Tbilisi, Tirana, and Glasgow, most welcome in Geneva. J'aimerais vous souhaiter tout d'abord, au nom des autorités de la ville de Genève, une très cordiale bienvenue à Genève à l'occasion de cette journée des villes. Et je remercie chaleureusement la Commission d'avoir pris cette initiative, puisqu'elle permet de nous réunir autour du thème « Ville intelligente et durable, moteur du développement durable ». Parvenir à la ville intelligente et durable est un objectif majeur et il est légitime qu'il occupe désormais une place essentielle dans la réflexion des villes pour une évolution pratique et utile de l'action publique dans les années à venir. Est-ce qu'une ville peut être le moteur du développement durable Cela ne fait aucun doute. Et Mme Algaïerova a d'ailleurs donné les chiffres et les données et les exemples qui montrent à quel point les villes sont en général des moteurs de l'évolution du monde. In 2015, the United Nations adopted the Agenda 2030 and the 17 Strategic Development Goals. All countries are supposed to tend to implement those 17 SDGs. But the cities have a crucial role to play in this context, and the city of Geneva tries its best to be an active player in this crucial collective goal. We didn't start today or yesterday. We started several years ago. Since 20 years, we started our first efforts to implement sustainable development in concrete public policies. Now, the city of Geneva is supporting this goal in two manners. First, to be a host city for very dense and active interactions, formal and informal. And so we have an enormous amount of international organizations, non-governmental organizations, experts, academics, private companies, civil society, which meet in Geneva and try to talk about very concrete issues like human rights, health, uh, uh, support in case of major crises and catastrophes, labor or trade. Most people don't realize how far the work being done in Geneva has a direct and immediate impact on the whole planet. And these activities try to contribute to the implementation of the 70s SDGs. D'autre part, la municipalité s'investit à l'échelle locale pour promouvoir un développement durable sur son territoire. Et nous agissons directement dans le cadre de nos activités et missions, ressources humaines, achats publics, construction et rénovation, gestion de l'espace public, prestations dans les domaines de la petite enfance, de l'accueil parascolaire, de la culture et du sport. Et nous soutenons aussi de nombreux acteurs de la société civile à Genève, associations, fondations et autres, qui ont des projets innovants. Et finalement, la ville de Genève est très active dans de nombreux réseaux, locaux et internationaux, qui permettent l'échange de bonnes pratiques, l'échange d'idées et de projets innovants. Et nous essayons de soutenir toute initiative qui va dans ce sens. As an example of this commitment in international local networks, we just joined the SHIFT campaign, uh, supported by the United Nations Rapporteur on um, Decent Housing. And we also signed the declaration, the international declaration of United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, we are a member of, on good housing. So that's only a few examples. And again, I'm very happy to welcome all of you in Geneva and have fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite uh, Mrs. Susan Eitken, leader of Glasgow City Council, to take the floor. Madam Leader, you have the floor. Uh, merci and um, bonjour. Um, thank you very much. I'm very grateful uh, to be here at the <coughs> 
the UND of Cities, and I congratulate UNECE and um, the Executive Secretary on, um, on, on recognising, on putting this day together and recognising the role, uh, the crucial role that cities play in ensuring that the UN Sustainable Development Goals go from the global to the local, and um, that they are actually delivered in a way which make a direct impact on communities and on people, and ultimately on making better places and better lives, which is um, their aim, uh, that's what they're for, um, but that needs to be put into practice, it needs to be put into action. And cities are the places where uh, there is the opportunity to innovate, um, there is the opportunity to, um, to try out different ways of um, implementing the sustainable development goals in real life, in real places. Cities face the greatest challenges, they have um, the greatest levels of inequality. Um, but that then also gives us the greatest opportunities to tackle inequality um, and the, the problems that people face in their lives and the problems that beset places which then impact on lives. Um, Glasgow has been um, very involved in doing this through our um, Urban Lab, which is a partnership between Glasgow City Council, which I lead, um, and the Glasgow School of Art, um, and which we were um, delighted was uh, recognised um, through the UNEC Charter Centre um, for the work that we're doing to implement the sustainable development goals in our local communities, in our city. Glasgow is a post-industrial city, possibly one of Europe's preeminent post-industrial cities, with all of the physical and social challenges that that brings. Um, and we are a city that um, is still in transition, but has made enormous progress towards becoming um, a knowledge and innovation-based economy. Um, housing, land and place are an enormous part of that. They're extremely important. But we are clear that housing, land and place can't sit alone, that they must uh, be developed and implemented in a way that has positive impacts in terms of sustainability, in terms of health, uh, in terms of community resilience um, and in terms of social inclusion and justice, social justice. So we do that in Glasgow within the context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We chart the course from global to local. Um, the, the sustainable goals um, come from the UN. They are then adopted at national level in, in Scotland. Um, and um, Scotland has, has uh, created its own national framework for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And then we in Glasgow uh, localise them and shape them um, to suit local neighbourhoods, local communities and local people. We are in um, the process just now of a programme of building 15,000 new affordable homes, most of them for social rent, over the current five-year period up until uh, 2022. And once we have built those homes as the um, strategic housing authority, they will be transferred to community-based housing associations uh, led by local people, uh, with local people taking ownership of both of the, the challenges that they face, but the solutions to them as well. Glasgow has a history that is littered with examples of um, attempts at urban renewal which failed because they were imposed from the top down uh, rather than generated organically from the bottom up. So we understand that that has to change. Um, that If we are to apply the sustainable development goals in a meaningful way which leads to better lives, then it must be local people and local communities which interpret those and which tell us how they need to be applied in practice. That's what Glasgow's Urban Lab is all about um, and that's why we're particularly delighted to be part of this Day of Cities um, and to have the opportunity to learn from uh, colleagues um, in Geneva, Tirana and Tbilisi and the many other cities who are attending here today. Thank you very much for these inspiring remarks and I would like now to give the floor to uh, Mr. Arian Veliaj, the Mayor of Tirana. Mr. Mayor. Okay, it's better now. Thank you so much for um, having us uh, come to Geneva. Um, we immediately embraced uh, the idea of the Executive Secretary to host an event for cities. <clears throat> the UN somehow represents the old world, world order. You know, you want to have all the countries in the map. But once you have the nation states, I think the obsession is mostly about covering land. 
When you involve cities, it's mostly about covering people. And I think there's a huge difference there. And with this concentration of people moving towards cities, you know, as my friend Sami would agree, we joked the last time, the bucket of responsibility stops with the mayor. There's no one else you can blame when you're a city manager. When you're in the state, there's some bureaucrat somewhere, there's some ministry somewhere that didn't deliver. I'll give you one example. How many of the countries that signed the COP21 actually delivered at least a quarter of the goals? Or one-fifth? Very, very few. Actually, most, many countries have actually denounced what they actually signed. But cities cannot do that. Once a city commits to something, the bucket stops with you. You have to deliver. And we see this more and more. Governments want to show up for a picture opportunity, hold hands like Boy Scouts on, on some big event about saving the planet. And yet, when it comes to delivering, it's the mayors who have to show, make sure the buses show up in time. It's the mayor who has to pick up a shovel and plant the tree. It's the mayor who has to, and the city budget, and city council, who has to finance uh, a bike lane. It's the mayor who makes a decision about which roads should be closed and which parts of the city that are polluted should be turned into uh, pedestrian. Uh, on, on the way here, I was helped by one of your uh, lovely assistants who almost excused herself and she said, to be honest, Mr. Mayor, I cover forest, but I'm so excited about this thing of the city. And I said, wait a minute, cities and forest can go together. Uh, we are in the moment in Tirana, not a rich country, in the process of planting two million trees by 2030. So we took this idea of this great Italian architect called Stefano Boeri, who then became our chief city architect, and he came up with this concept called Bosco Verticale, so a vertical forest, buildings covered with trees. And then we twisted this a bit and we turned to something called Bosco Orbitale, an orbital forest. And in a place and in a time of our populist politics where everybody's speaking about walls, we're also speaking about walls, but they're green, they're permeable, they look like linear parks, and they are there to contain sprawl and give a hint that we're not gonna pollute and carry on uh, covering more green land for concrete and for housing. And there's ways that we can do this with quality and density rather than spread everywhere. So my aim here today, other than uh, embrace uh, the executive secretary's um, idea, is to also be able to testify that countries that are not necessarily EU members, cities that are not necessarily rich and wealthy, can come up with very, very creative and, and cost-free solutions. And you know, in cities, the biggest infrastructure change you can make is only 10 centimeters long. So the space from here to here mostly has to do with mentality and changing our way of lives rather than pouring millions and billions um, into infrastructure. Um, a second argument was cities are places where we show up for life. You know, we fall in love in cities, most likely. We go to university in cities. When we go and protest, we protest in a city. So if, if cities are epicenters of public life, then we should look at all aspects of public life. You know, as mayors or as politicians or, or diplomats, we usually are trained early on to only think of voters and taxpayers. But this is a bit lame because cities are also made of children under 18 who don't pay taxes, who don't vote, but who are a, an amazing, powerful force for change. So we've tried to shape Tirana as a leading child-friendly city, not only as just putting toys for kids to play, but transforming the whole city works in accessibility. So the concept of Urban 95, which we work with, says that can the city be accessed by a 95 centimeter human being, which is exactly a three-year-old? Um, because we see that as an indicative species, and sometimes to shape the city after an indicative species, just like a rare bird or a rare seal or a rare fish, you know, a rare human uh, that has access to crossways, to kindergartens, to public buildings, to a forest, to a park, um, is one way to creatively transform the way we do urban planning, the way we do budgeting, the way we do housing, or the way we do um, academic institutions. So I'm happy to be here today and would love to encourage cities to think creatively, not necessarily expensively, uh, but with some fantasy about how we can manage things around and get our cities more uh, sustainable. And I also want to thank my, my good friend uh, Sami for hosting us in Geneva. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your thought-provoking remarks. And I would like now to give the floor to Maya Bitadze, Deputy Mayor of Tbilisi. Madam Mayor, you have the floor. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really honor for me to participate in this uh, press conference today morning 
and it's really honor for me also to participate in this very important event, State of the, of the Cities, and I want to thank UNC for organizing it. Uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals, but I want to emphasize the role of the local authorities in implementation of Sustainable uh, Development Goals. The Goal 11, the Goal 16, Resilient Cities, Just Institutions, those are the main tools to achieve Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, while the central government uh, established the policies, it's the local authorities who are the uh, main points of enforcement. Uh, the, in the era of urbanization, in the era of transformation, we are talking about smart cities, the smart tools of implementation, but what people need, the people need reliable infrastructure, the reliable transport, the housing, the green and uh, the environment, the, the protection of the environment is one of the main priorities of the citizens in Tbilisi as well. It's one of the main challenges we have. And it's one of the main, um, the main uh, challenge the politicians have so far in Tbilisi. So, um, I think that uh, it is very important to bring together the mayors, the deputy mayors, all the executives who are responsible to implement sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals should be included in the daily life, in the daily work. And I want to agree that it's very important to change a behavior. And uh, in Tbilisi, we also believe that it's the future generation, it's our children who will play a significant role in establishing the future we want. So I think that it is very important that we are here and I hope that uh, the day of the cities will play a significant role in furthering SDGs, in furthering SDGs through the executive bodies and I hope that uh, d during the uh, next years, uh, the role of the municipalities will raise in execution and in implementation SDGs. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I would now like to open the floor to your questions. If you would please introduce yourselves before asking your questions so our guests uh, know where, which journalist, where, where is your media. Uh, so. The floor is open. Vos questions? Yes, please. Good morning. My name is Anne Le Croix. I work for a Japanese newspaper, the Asahi Shimbun. And my question is for the UNECE Executive Secretary. Um, you mentioned the challenge of aging population in cities. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what uh, your organization is doing to meet that challenge? And I understand there is a working group on aging in, in cities. Can you elaborate a little bit on the, the role of this working group? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have our unit uh, that is dedicated to the population and population trends. So first of all, what you need is statistics uh, just to, to address the right policies. So our uh, whole statistics division is working uh, very much on uh, data, on population. They are preparing methodologies, uh, how to measure, and uh, they produce indicators how to measure. And then we are, if we stay with statistics, we are uh, working with uh, all national statistics offices in the region, and we develop the capacity to use the right methodologies and indicators, because it's very important that all of us in, in the region, we measure in the same harmonized way. Uh, second one, um, of course, uh, the, the leader in the region is Portugal, you know. They organized a big conference on aging. Uh, it was uh, last year in Lisbon. And uh, I gave you, for instance, one example that uh, our, one of our projects has supported Georgia to develop policies in areas such as accessible public transport for older persons and housing provision. 
so there are many activities you can find also on our website for, for the shortage of time we cannot mention all of them but uh, aging is uh, one of our biggest challenges in our region you know uh, because you have continents like africa that are uh, i believe they they medium age is uh, something between 20 and 25 years uh, in europe uh, Aging is really an issue. We need to develop uh, not only policies for for governments, and now I am happy that this, we have cities today, because in all areas we need to develop economies. It's called a silver economy that uh, is uh, producing products for, for elderly people. Uh, we don't work so much on uh, pension systems and uh, in the region because uh, we have so complex membership, you know, starting with the EU who have their own uh, policies and then uh, in our, we, are, we have, our member states are 56, you know, we are covering the EU, then the Balkans, the Caucasus, or the former Soviet Union, including Central Asia, United States, Canada, Turkey, Israel, and Switzerland, so it's impossible to, to find some common approach to, to the pension policies. I didn't get you what was the second part of your question, or did I answer your question? No, I think you answered. It was mostly about the working group as well uh, on aging, but I think you answered already, so thank okay. you very much. Thank you. D'autres questions? Oui, Gorgi. Bonjour, Gorgi Ndeuil, Soleil de Dakar et Continent Premier. Uh, moi, on a parlé tout à l'heure de l'Afrique, mais um, de manière incidente, la question serait posée à M. Samy Kanan, notre ami Samy Kanan, comme ça c'est plus clair et c'est en français, s'il vous plaît. Euh, la question est de savoir, c'est vrai qu'on parle beaucoup de l'Europe, c'est vrai que cette réunion concerne ces euh, ONU, mais la question est de savoir, est-ce qu'il y a aujourd'hui un lien qui serait fait avec vos autres collègues des autres villes, que ce soit en Afrique ou en Amérique latine. Et euh, la question aussi fondamentale, c'est que vous pouvez avoir des objectifs pour des villes durables, comme vous voulez, mais si vous, vos États, l'exécutif, ne vous aide pas, comment vous allez vous en sortir Je vous remercie. Merci, Gorgi. Toujours d'excellentes questions. Alors effectivement, nos contacts ne se limitent pas à la région Europe au sens large, même dans la définition de la Commission économique des Nations unies. Euh, nous avons des contacts à travers la planète, puisque malgré les différences euh, géographiques, culturelles, climatiques, nous avons énormément de points communs. Euh, nous sommes membres de plusieurs réseaux euh, très actifs sur le plan international, sur le plan francophone déjà, l'Association internationale des maires francophones, où il y a évidemment beaucoup de membres africains mais aussi de, de CGLU, donc Cité et Gouvernement Locaux Unis, euh, qui couvre toute la planète. Et les réseaux de villes sont dans une situation intéressante où euh, ils favorisent l'échange de bonnes pratiques. On a une motivation mutuelle de comment gérer nos situations concrètes. Et ça permet aussi de faire entendre la voix des villes au niveau international. C'est-à-dire pas seulement de travailler entre nous, mais de porter la voix des villes euh, sur le plan international. Et comme ça a été dit par Mme Algaïerova, de plus en plus, les Nations Unies, qui est une organisation d'État, et toutes les agences spécialisées et les grandes organisations euh, internationales autres, comme le comité de la Croix-Rouge, euh, développent leurs liens avec les réseaux de villes pour un échange euh, très proche du terrain. Comme l'a dit le maire de Tirana, nous sommes proches de la réalité de terrain. Donc euh, ces contacts sont très intenses. Du coup, pour ta deuxième question, oui, euh, c'est vrai que les États font les lois en général. Euh, ils ont les leviers euh, législatifs. Donc s'ils n'appuient pas les objectifs du développement durable, c'est difficile pour les villes. Ce que nous avons les villes, c'est la force de la proximité, la légitimité de la proximité. C'est qu'à un moment donné, si les villes se mettent ensemble, les États devront suivre le mouvement. Catherine Fiancan. Oui, bonjour, good morning. Um, my question is, uh, I'm working for Belgian uh, Radio Television. Um, I would like uh, to know uh, a bit, to have some details in, uh, from the different mayors, how you tackled uh, the problem of this decent housing. We know that more and more we have problems, economical problems, 
um, in this part of Europe, uh, but I would like to know how you are dealing with this problem in your different uh, regions and different cities. Thank you. From the panel, who wants to start? <laughs> Um, very good question. Um, just to give you an, an overview, uh, I serve a city of about a million people, which since the time I became mayor has grown with 100,000 people, which is average, average 25 to 27,000 people per annum every year. Um, I sometimes joke, being in the Western Balkans, that I manage everybody's plan B. And people sort of are surprised, as, you know, what is plan A? Well, if you're plan A and you live in a remote province, you know, old communist town that didn't survive the fall of the Cold War and the Berlin Wall, where the mine factories closed down and the military barracks closed down. Plan A is to go to Belgium or Switzerland. If that fails, plan B is to come to the capital. So that's why we manage everybody's plan B, and particularly young people come for university and they never go back to the rural areas where, where they came from. Some, it's arithmetics. So basically, if you grow by 25,000 people a year, you divide that by three, you have to give enough housing permits to six, 7,000 uh, apartments in order to keep up. Anyone who tries to act like they're pro-environment and they can't do this uh, basic division uh, to divide the number of people by three for the number of housing units they need to issue every year, uh, they're simply fooling themselves because it's not sustainable. Otherwise, people will either start building illegally or the black market will, uh, will flourish. It doesn't work. So, so good urban planning to make up for the extra supply of people is uh, paramount. Now, how about the people, this is about the people who can afford housing. How about the people who can't afford housing? Well, first, this is demand and supply. If you keep a constant supply in the market, then, you know, the pricing will, we have seen four years, uh, almost zero increase in pricing, simply because um, getting a house should not become an episode of the Hunger Games. When, you know, you get so many people fighting for, like it's an auction, it shouldn't be an auction. Uh, then a very generous package. Now, Sami and I happen to also be socialists, so clearly we believe in progressive politics and it's, it's pretty evident what we're about to say. Um, for those who can't afford anything, we run a very uh, steady social housing uh, program. Now we have also changed the law and instead of doing social housing the old way, which was the ghetto style of having neighborhoods only for social housing, we are asking all developers to get 3% of their building volume for every permit they get from the municipality to our social housing stock, which gets us social housing dispersed equally uh, across the city rather than in one area. Third, uh, for people who can't pay uh, the, the current uh, rent rates, uh, most people prefer to buy in our city, but some, rent, some do rent, we do something called a rent subsidy, uh, which is basically a monthly uh, uh, cash payment that we send to people's accounts. If they can prove that you know, they have a kid at school and they have a work nearby, they can't live in a remote area, so we will subsidize the gap between the market rate and the rate that they can actually pay, and we have a software mechanism that calculates this. Fourth, um, um, we have a very aggressive program called soft loans, which, where we give about a thousand apartments a year, mostly to young couples. So it's a program that targets families who have chosen our city to live, and we need to give a helping hand. We basically pay the interest, and they only pay uh, sort of the base uh, uh, loan uh, installment. But by removing the interest for about 20 years, which is the loan duration, Instead of buying rent, they're buying a square meter um, every month uh, through their installments rather than slaving their, themselves to, um, to the bank. So this is four or five ideas that have worked for us. Maybe they can work somewhere else too. Thank you. Oui, merci. Alors, euh, je rejoins dans les grandes lignes, évidemment, les postulats de mon collègue Tirana. Euh, Genève a effectivement un gros problème de logement accessible parce que nous avons connu une croissance économique et démographique importante dans la région, avec les bons côtés, mais aussi les revers, les effets pervers, c'est-à-dire pas assez de logements à prix accessibles pour les personnes à bas revenus, les jeunes familles, les personnes âgées retraitées, ainsi de suite. Et donc, il y a plusieurs réponses à ça. D'une part, nous avons des lois sur la manière de gérer les zones de développement, là où on construit, pour imposer des ratios de logements à prix abordables, pour les promoteurs, 
Le défi économique, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, il y a tellement d'argent qui cherche des voies d'investissement dans le monde, donc les banques, les caisses de pension et ainsi de suite, les assureurs, qu'ils investissent beaucoup dans la pierre puisque ça reste lucratif, mais avec le revers de la médaille que les rendements parfois sont excessifs au détriment de la cohésion sociale et ça s'applique aussi au logement. Donc euh, nous essayons de favoriser la construction de logements soit directement par nous-mêmes, soit en soutenant toutes les initiatives indépendantes mais non lucratives, les coopératives et les autres formes de logements organisés mais dont le but n'est pas forcément lucratif, ce qui permet d'avoir des logements abordables. Et puis, il y a des lois qui défendent heureusement les locataires, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'est pas facile d'expulser un locataire. Ça, c'est très important. C'est défensif, mais ça permet aussi d'éviter une aggravation de la situation. Donc, c'est un ensemble de mesures. On a pu réaugmenter le nombre de nouveaux logements mis sur le marché, des logements abordables, pour essayer de remonter la pente dans ce domaine. Mais c'est absolument vital pour la cohésion sociale d'une ville. Sinon, à la fin, les gens s'éloignent du centre-ville. Et donc, c'est catastrophique pour l'identité des villes. Um, in Glasgow, I uh, mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a program, a very large housing building program, probably the biggest in a generation. Um, Glasgow in the past uh, was famous for building um, almost ghetto style uh, social housing estates. The Scottish word is schemes, um, and we built them on the edge of the city. Um, so we have reversed that. Uh, and I would echo what other colleagues have said about um, mixed tenure, um, mixed community where no one can tell whether you rent your home, uh, whether you rent it privately, whether you rent it socially, or whether you own your home. Um, it should be um, our ambition that when we look at the new places and new communities that we're developing, um, no one knows or indeed cares uh, what the tenure of your home is. Um, in Glasgow, the, um, the, the setup that we have where um, our community-based local housing associations uh, lead on development. We oversee it as the Strategic Housing Authority. It's funded by the Scottish Government, um, and we're very lucky that we are aligned um, in the city with our national government in Scotland, that we both have um, affordable homes and the, the building of affordable homes as a significant priority. Um, but it's delivered at local level and what that allows our, um, our neighbourhood based housing associations to do is to really innovate, to work with private developers um, in order to build those mixed tenure estates. But what we find um, increasingly in Glasgow is that it's the social rented homes that are setting the standard. They are of the highest quality. They're of the highest quality in terms of sustainability, um, in terms of um, fuel efficiency. Um, they're um, often um, uh, aesthetically uh, the most attractive as well so what we're doing in Glasgow is setting a standard and setting a challenge for private developers um, a challenge yes to ensure that they build a percentage of homes for social rent um, or for co-ownership um, in every within every private development um, but also to live up to the standards of, of sustainability um, that are being set by um, by the city and by our social rented sector and um, that's a, that's a huge change and it's a real turnaround from the way that Glasgow used to do things and um, but for us that that's absolutely the future our challenge is land and um, as a post-industrial city much of um, the land within the city what we call brownfield sites is contaminated and um, so our challenge is to detoxify that land before we can build on it and um, but our focus is to turn um, what we, the, we have more vacant and derelict land than any other city in the UK in Glasgow. Um, and the poorer someone is, the more likely they are to live close to a piece of vacant and derelict land. So our focus is to transform that vacant and derelict land into places, uh, not just housing, but places, communities, um, places where people can, can work, um, where they can uh, enjoy cultural opportunities, leisure opportunities um, alongside um, um, living in very high quality, decent homes. Uh, we are not building on green land. We are not building out of the city. We are building within the city. And we won't build out of the city until we have used up all of our vacant and derelict land within the city. Madame Bitadze. And I'm, before you start, I'm afraid we'll have to close uh, quickly now because we need to we need to move to the uh, to the opening of the conference. So, Madam Mayor, please. 
thank you very much. I'll try to be very brief. On behalf of Tbilisi, Tbilisi has its own story, not success story, unfortunately. Uh, we experienced the 10 years of deregulation in the field of urban development. I mean the, the, the regulations in the housing, the regulations with regards to the construction permits, which lead to, uh, which lead to a very dramatic um, uh, dramatic uh, um, uh, deterioration of the general housing and urban conditions in, in the capital. So the deregulation uh, of the legal acts was uh, made only in Tbilisi and uh, another, Tbili another uh, city, city of Batumi, uh, which uh, now is very obvious. It it is felt physically. So uh, during uh, the last one year, when the new mayor uh, came into office, uh, we we um, uh, developed a very strict uh, regulations by means of uh, uh, somehow framing the construction permits and somehow thinking about different urban developments, the urban development which is in line with the economic development of the city. Unfortunately, the, the regulation uh, also touched the housing, as I told. We have serious problems with hazardous buildings, with uh, the social housing, and now we are in a process of elaboration, the regulations and tackling the everyday problems, the city of the one third of the population of the whole country. So it is uh, very obvious for, uh, for us, for the, um, for the mayor's office, that it is very important. And I, I heard here the, the method uh, of uh, dealing with uh, the social housing. And I want to um, highlight that in Georgia, in Tbilisi, we also imposed uh, five percent uh, of compensation for the uh, private companies, construction companies, to p put in the compensation fund for the social housing. It's one of the newest regulation we imposed in the past uh, one month. So uh, we have uh, already done many reforms, and we think that too too many others will be um, now will be uh, applied in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm afraid we'll have to stop here because the Executive Secretary and the Mayor of Geneva have to open the conference. So uh, thank you very much. If you have uh, journalists, uh, one more question to the, to the other three mayors. They can spend maybe another five minutes, but uh, we have to suspend now. Thank you. Uh, okay. If I may, I just wanted to tell, we have two basic documents on spe when speaking on housing, and this is UN Geneva Charter on Sustainable Housing. And the uh, second one uh, produced by UNEC is because cities consume more than 60% of the global energy and produce more than 70% of the global greenhouse uh, gas emissions. We have our uh, UN guidelines for energy efficiency standards in buildings. So this is what I suppose. Thank you very much for your attention for coming today.